with lecture, we're going to talk about universal gravitation today and push forward into chap through chapter 3 and, and deeper into chapter 4. Uh, there will be some homework, number 7, uh, requiring extra additional reading. Uh, uh, fairly simple. Um, and that will be ready for you sometime tomorrow. But before we do that, I want to discuss the exam printouts that you just got. First, if you look at the very top of your printout in the upper right, it'll have a number of points, and it'll have a percentage, and it'll have a raw score, I think. Okay. Now, the percentage, just put a cross at that out, put an X through that, because that doesn't have anything to do with the eye clicker points. They know nothing about your eye clicker points. I know about your eye clicker points, but they don't. All they know about is a scantron. So that percentage, I mean, it's the percentage of 46, but not the percentage of 50. So you may as well just cross it out. But the raw score and the points are good. Now, if you're looking at your, your printout, that pointage up there is what goes in web courses uh, in one of the three new lines of the grades page. All right, we'll go to that in just a minute. Okay, that's the exam one Scantron. Another factor, another part of that printout is toward the middle in, on the top is uh, test form. And it'll say test form A, B, C, or D. All right. Now, if a, a few of you forgot to fill in the test form, or it, uh, so I think if somebody in this class, they didn't get a, did somebody say that they didn't get a grade up, up or down? I think there's somebody in here that was supposed to get it. We have their Scantron, but they bubbled in every dot, PID, test form, and 46 questions so light, they considered it blank. They didn't grade it. All right. So, it, so a, a few of you uh, messed up your PID. You know, like if you didn't bubble in a dot or you had the wrong number or something like that. We figured it out. For those of you that didn't bubble in test form, it couldn't be graded. But we figured out what your score was, and it's going to be in web courses. As soon as I unlock and activate that row of your grades page, uh, but you won't be getting a printout. All right, so next time you're on the midterm exam, make sure you bubble in everything I tell you to bubble, and everything will be good. Um, another thing, I want everybody to look very carefully at their printout, and. Riley, what I want you to look at, and everybody, is see if you have any that are marked blank. All right? From 1 to 46, do you have any that are marked? Raise your hand if you have one that's marked blank. 1, 2, uh, okay, 3. Okay. Now look and see if you have any that the computer saw two dots or two answers, like any of the items have A comma C or something like that. Anybody have a double answer? Because that'll be marked wrong. Any double answers? Okay, those of you with blanks, bring them up here and give them to Miss Darian and she'll check your Scantron. Bring them up right now. Possible. If you have a blank on your printout, good. And we'll see if you really do have a blank. Or if it was bubbled in so light it didn't register. All right. Now return to your seats and start taking notes, and we'll give these to you at the end of class, okay? All right. We'll double check it for you. Okay, dear. Now, last thing I want to mention to you is that this printout that you have, you'll get one of these for each of the three midterms. 
whichever ones that you attend and take and bubble in the PID and bubble in the test form, you'll get a printout like this. I, but all it does is tell you, you know, question 11, you got it wrong because you bubbled in B and it was supposed to be A or something like that. But it doesn't really tell you, well, what ideas was I getting incorrect? Did I, you know, was I messing up Newton's third law through the whole test? Or was there, you know, something? Um, so what I have for everyone is a blurb page. And the blurb is a PDF file that is published in web courses. Um, there's a link to the blurbs page on the home page. Um, and what the, here's, here's what, I think this is from the first class. Your blurbs page will look like this. Um, this is questions 9 through 11. I don't know, what, what, test form B or something like that. Um, and it, so it tells you, okay, if you did get number 11 wrong on this test form, well, that was definition of Newtons in terms of fundamental units, all right? All right, so this tells you, I mean, it tells you which items you got wrong and what the basic concept was. Now, I don't give you the exams back. I don't post the verbatim tests on the Internet, all right? But we do give you this, and each item on the test, except for the matching, now that's formulas, but other than the matching, all the true-false, all the multi, you can see a little blurb about each one. And with your printout, you can then see, all right, I better, for the final, I better study, you know, Newton's third law and then definition of acceleration just to, for, you know, extra study. Okay? So these blurbs uh, are a really nice study tool uh, in conjunction with your printout. Uh, so keep them, and by the end of the semester, you're going to be happy to have it. All right? King. Okay. Yeah, each test. So look at your, scan, your, your printout, and it'll say test form A, B, C, or D, and then go in web courses and uh, download the PDF for your test form. It'll say, it'll say like exam one, blurb C, or something like that. All right? And then use that to correlate with your printout and your and your cooking. Now the exception to that is if you uh, Mivosh can come to office hours and anybody, if you can come to office hours, I'll let you look at the verbatim test. You can't copy it, but you can eyeball it and take notes, and then you have you can read and basically re go over the test, you know, the questions that you want to review, but only in web in, in office hours. Okay, so that's an option. If you can't make it to office hours, you know, you know, and maybe you can catch me on a Friday. By the way, Fridays I'm I'm frequently on campus at my office in Physical Sciences Building, uh, room one five six, because uh, I have faculty meetings on Friday, and unfortunately I'm requ <laughs> required to go to those, even though I'd like to ditch them. Uh, but anyways, you can sometimes catch me, you know, at that point. All right, questions about the printouts? What is your name again? Camille? Did I answer your question? Good. Any other questions? Good. Now, I want to talk about your clicking, all right? Now, this is what the grades page looks like. Now, your, your exam one Scantron, it's embargoed right now. It's on mute. I hit the mute button. And usually I do that until I hand back printout. So this afternoon, I'll unmute that row of your grades page, and you'll see what your execs, I mean, you'll say the, see the same things on your printout. Uh, but now the exam one clicking is right above that, and that tells you how many points that you scored uh, out of possible seven, four regular and three bonus. So in this particular case, this, uh, this sample student has five points, and that reflects partial credit. Okay? Uh, and I want to show you uh, some examples 
of how I look at your score, excuse me, how I look at your answers, and then make decisions about partial credit. All right. So let's take a look at uh, one. Of, basically, when you do the self-paced questions like you did Tuesday, I look at a spreadsheet. Now, here's one of the few cells of the spreadsheet. This is for the answer uh, right over here in the left column. Uh, those are answers that students typed in for the first question at the stadium. Uh, I believe it was a drop distance. And the answer was 30.6 meters to the nearest tenth of a meter. Uh, and this student typed in negative 30.6. Now that's incorrect because it shouldn't be negative. Uh, but I did decide to give uh, that particular student one partial credit point. So if you have one point, it might be something like this. You know, one point on the exam, one clicking row of your grades page. A few people, a few people uh, actually got all seven of the iClicker points, so that's good. All right. Anyways, this particular student got partial credit. Now, I want you to look at this one. Here's another slice of the spreadsheet. Uh, and this one is, check that out. That's the brain burner. And the answer was 31.3 meters per second of upward speed. And I see a bunch of you nodding your head. And, um, and a lot of people got it right. Not every, Some people didn't even try it. You know, I saw one person that typed in IDK. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get on their case too bad, but I'd prefer if you try to type in an answer anyways. But anyways, now, so what I do is I sort the columns that have all the answers. And then I look at, you know, and there's going to be a, a lot of 31.3, 31.3, 31.3. And then there's going to be answers that are similar to that, like this one, equals 31.3. So I looked at that and I said, all right, I'll cut this guy a break and I'll give him three points. Three bo I'll say, yeah, he got it. He's, he's kind of a uh, little fat finger error there with the equal sign, but we'll call it good. All right. Now, if that was you, then you got the benefit of uh, me eyeballing the data. You know, Scantrons can't do this, but I can do it with the iClicker answers that you type in. Here's another one. This is the coin stopping time for which the correct answer was 1.85 seconds. And some of you, uh, 1.9, I gave you credit for 1.9. Because I, 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 I biffed it with the, the typo on there, so I gave people with 1.9 correct answer. Look at this guy, 1.8 S. So, okay, he forgot his x-ray specs. He didn't realize that was an S and not a 5. So I gave him two points for that one. All right. So I can have mercy. You know, I give you partial credit. And I, this guy gave full credit. You know, I said, all right. That's not an accidental typo. That's, a, that's an attempt at a 5. And you guys, I, I especially hate the decimal point on the eye clicker, it is so small and hard to see. It's just a pain on the... Now, this one is from the Brain Burner. And actually, this question here, 3.19, 3.2, uh, I gave those one point of partial credit because that's actually the drop time. That's not the answer for the question, though. The question was, what's the initial... VIY. It's based on this number. This is the number that you need to figure out VIY. But this itself is not VIY. This is the drop time or the rise time. All right. So this particular, you would say this is an intermediate answer or an intermediate value in your calculation. So I said, all right, I'll give this student a point. All right. And uh, so, so if you have a score that's not a four, or a seven, actually a four could be a three and a one. Anyways, 
no matter, you know, so a bunch of you, a lot of people have uh, partial credit. So that's good. And I'm very happy to do that. All right. Now, questions about partial credit and so forth. Shana, I have your printout up here. No, you get it after class. Come up after class. How about you guys all the way in the back row? Hey, no questions back there? Okay, right, let's keep going. I want to talk about the participation data roundup that I posted yesterday. Here's what it looks like in the grades page. Okay, it's right below the homework data. Well, depending on how you sort the grades page. And you can sort it by alphabetic order too. Anyways, this one here, 0208 summary comma answers, that tells me, or that's where I post, how many answers you've clicked in. Now, some of you don't have all 11. I mean, it's the maximum amount of 11 from the two lectures we had last week. You know, January 31st, last Tuesday, February 2nd, last Thursday. Okay, we had 11 questions, five and six. All right, now, some of you don't click by the time Miss Darian shuts down the question, and she is mean. So she doesn't look like it, but she's very mean about clicking the question closed. And if you don't get your answer in by that time, you're not going to have 11 here. All right? Here's the other one. Uh, 0208 summary, correct answers. Okay? And so this particular sample student had 11 questions answered, but only seven of them answered correctly. All right, now. Both of them are based on an 11 point or 11 questions having been asked. Now, right now, 11 questions is not really very much, no great shakes. But by the end of the semester, we'll probably be over 100 somewhere. All right. And so if you're, you know, like, like this guy, 7 out of 11, by the end of the semester, if we have 111 questions, he might be at 107 out of 11, 111, and that would be pretty good if he doesn't make any more mistakes. So um, the 25 out of 25 participation points possible that you can get for your semester grade, that's 10% of your semester grade, comes out of this number, how many you have answered. So... If by the end of the semester you're at 85% of that number or more, ding, 25 points. Okay, it's a nice chunk of change. But you won't know until the last week of the semester where you fall. All right? Because we're always going to be adding to the number. It's, it's 11 now, but by the end of the semester it's going to be a lot different. Okay? Now this one over here, I'm not sure if I mentioned to this section, but I keep a track of how many questions you've answered correctly because at the end of the semester, if you have answered 75% of them correctly, that's a B, in class, then I give you four bonus points. Right? That's a nice chunk of bonus points. It's over 1%, you know, 250 points basis. So 1% is, uh, oh no, so Let's see, 1% of 250 is 2.5. So if I give you four bonus points, that's more than 1%. Okay, that's nice. That could be just what you need to bring you over the borderline from C to B, from B to A. And that's what you want to be able to do. Anyway, so I keep track of both. Now, you may also have noticed I got rid of that L7 thing that I did last week, just fooling around. Okay, don't worry about that. This is what we're going to have. And I'll do this two, three times more this semester, four times maybe, okay? And I won't be doing it every week, but maybe every two, three weeks, something like that, all right? So maybe one more time before exam two, then after exam two, then after exam three, and then right before the final, something like that. So you'll kind of know, not every day, but fairly close to that. Now, questions about participation.
Okay, let's keep going. I have a clicker question for you. Turn on your clicker. We're on frequency BB, Bravo, Bravo. If you haven't used your clicker before, or if you use it for another class with a different frequency, uh, hold the power button down until the rectangle flashes, then type BB, and you'll be on. You'll get the Go Nitro message, and then the Ready message, and then with your mind, with that blob of gray psychological matter at the top of your neck, I want you to answer this question. An object is accelerated, but never speeds up and never slows down. What kind of acceleration is it? Boy, we're really quiet. See, let's see the display. No, no. Oh, the end. Display. Dis the end. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Not the same as last class. Dude, there's no option E. That was the same as last class. Really, they had one. Okay, good. All right, save somebody a little bit of. Ah, no, don't do it. No, stop. Okay. No! <laughs> oh, now you're playing with me. Yeah. All right, whoever does... See, I don't know who does that. I'll figure it out. I'll figure out who's trying to burn my grits by pre pressing E. All right, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, display please. Now we have a whole range of answers here. And like the previous class, the correct answer, sideways, is the least populated answer. All right, now we're going to talk about that. And the question here, if something doesn't speed up, there's no newtons of force in the direction of the motion. If it doesn't slow down, there's no newtons of force in the opposite direction to slow it down. All right. So if it's getting an acceleration, but neither speeds up nor slows down, it's not, it's not getting any newtons forward. It's not getting any aft. It's got to be sideways newtons. Right? And that's the answer here. Now, what we're going to do is use uh, Newton's laws. This is a cover page from the English translation of his famous book, The Principia. You know, he wrote it in Latin, which I can't read. So I have to read the English translation. Here's the cover page of it. And what we're going to do today is study uniform circular motion. And so draw yourself a circle. And out to the right somewhere, draw an object on the circle. And Anthony, draw a radius um, from the center out to the object. Now I've got mine over here at three o'clock. Right, you put yours wherever you want. And uniform circular motion means this. It's on a circular path and the speed doesn't vary. But it's on a circular path. So Elizabeth, its velocity is changing. Okay. The velocity changes even though the speed does not. It's getting some sideways newtons. All right, so here it goes. Look at that. It's going around and around in a circle. Now, that's constant speed, uh, but not constant direction. Now, in Chapter 3-6, which we kind of skipped over. We're tackling it today. Um, this diagram is there, the discussion of the Nardo ring. And just make a note, um, these triangles from the textbook, this red one down here is based on the positions of the car on the Nardo ring at two different points in time. 
And then this other triangle with delta V and the two Vs, uh, that's based on these velocity arrows, V1 and V2, in the textbook. Now, I'm going to um, go to this diagram here. I, I made them a little bit less slivery, a little bit bigger triangles. Here's the velocity triangle over here, okay? And here's the position triangle over here, all right? And what we're going to do is use the, because it's, it's circular motion, and because the velocity is tangential to the circle, that means that the two triangles are proportional. Now, we're going to use this proportionality, a geometric concept, to deduce this dynamic concept called centripetal acceleration. And centripetal means toward the center, as I explain in the textbook. So it's, an, it's a sideways acceleration. So it means you're not changing the speed necessarily, but you are changing the direction by getting some sideways acceleration from sideways either port or starboard Newtons. Okay? So um, here's the proportion we're going to start with, and same as in the textbook. Now let's look at the parts of this proportion. There's two ratios and an equal sign between them. On the left you have a numerator V delta T. Now that's basically delta X over here. On a circle, the true distance is not a delta X. It's more like a V delta T because you're on a circle, moving at a certain speed for a certain amount of time. But it's close to delta X. Right? So um, now the denominator here is the long side. Now, these are isosceles triangles. They're not isosceles right triangles. They're isosceles acute triangles. All right. Now, the isosceles sides are just the position radii, the position vectors. Each this, It's a circle, so every position is going to be our distance from the center. That's what makes it a circle. Right now, if you have an elliptical path, you know, like some satellite in space, yeah, it's going to be different. But for circular, yep, isosceles triangle. And then the base of it is delta X or V delta T. Okay, so the top of the left-hand quotient is the base of the isosceles triangle. And the bottom of the left-hand quotient is the isosceles side of the right triangle or of the isosceles triangle, all right? Now, that's for the position triangle. The, the isosceles sides are the, the two equal sides. Isosceles means equals, two sides equal. Yeah, so the two equal ones are R and R, all right? And the one that's not is the equals the base in this sketch. Now, it is possible to get an isosceles triangle for which the sides are equal to the base. That would be an equilateral triangle. But anyways, if it's not equilateral, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it'll be, you know, so if it's, if it's acute, you know, it'll be, you know, something like this. Now, over here on the right side, this quotient on the right, this is from the velocity triangle, right? Position on the left quotient, Velocity on the right, right? So the base of the velocity triangle, that's this one up here, this dashed line, delta V, right? My two Vs are here and here. Here's my V1 over here, here's V2 over here, right? The difference between tip to tip, that's delta V, right? So that goes in the numerator here. That's the, that's the base of the velocity isosceles triangle. Now, the isosceles side of the velocity triangle is V and V. So that goes in the denominator over here. All right? So we have two ratios. And because you're on a circular path, and because the velocity and the position vectors are perpendicular, you're, in other words, sideways acceleration, if you, if it's always going like this. They're always at right angles to each other. 
So if, if the position changes by 10 degrees, the velocity is going to change by 10 degrees. And that means that the sharp angle is always going to be the same for a velocity triangle as for the position triangle if it's circular, if it's a circular path. All right? So this is my set of proportions here, uh, base over long side, position triangle. And then on the right side, base over long side for the velocity triangle. All right. So far, no surprises. This is just geometry. Now, we want to get a dynamical interpretation. And the way that we can do that is by rearranging some of the furniture. Right now, this V on the denominator on the right side, this V in the bottom of the velocity triangle proportion, I'm going to park that in the left side up on top by cross multiplication. Right, so this V is going to go upstairs. Here it is. It's now a V squared. And the delta T from the left side upstairs, I'm going to push that over here. Now, delta V over delta T, that's your definition of acceleration. So this quotient here, V squared over R, is equal to delta V over delta T, and that's an acceleration. And the smaller the time increment between your two positions, the closer and closer uh, this gets to an exact expression. So we take this as the definition of centripetal acceleration. Right? A, a, C, a subscript C equals V squared over R. If you know the V and you know the R and you know that it's a circle, ding, you know what the acceleration is. Here's a visual summary. Okay, it If it's uniform circular motion, that means the length of that red velocity arrow is not changing. The direction's changing because you're getting some sideways Newtons. You know, that, that acceleration is sideways, A subscript C, it's toward the center. Centripetal means toward the center. The word that you never want to use is centrifugal. Okay, I'll even spell it out for you. You can write it down in your notes. C-E-N-T-R-I-F-U-G-A-L. Centrifugal. Okay. All right. Centrifugal acceleration, centrif centrifugal force. C-E-N-T-R-I-F-U-G-A-L. Okay. Now that you've got it written down in your notes, I want you to cross it out. Because I don't want you to ever use it. But I do want you to use centripetal. C-E-N-T-R-I-P-E-T-A-L. All right, here's R. That's the distance from the center of the circle out to the position. And that's for any position on the circle. I mean, that's what a circle is. It's the set of points in space that are all the same distance from a given point called the center. All right, now, if you want to get centripetal, if you're on like the Nardo ring, that big circular track, test track down the boot heel of Italy, it could be kind of cool to go down there, drive around, you know, 160 miles an hour. You have to have some centripetal acceleration to keep yourself on the circle. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from having some tires that have a little bit of grip, right? So here's your formula. Centripetal acceleration from the road surface on the tires. Okay, the tires are, you know, they're trying to push the road outwards. And the road is therefore pushing you inwards centripetally. Um, that's going to be V squared over R. So centripetal acceleration, V squared over R. Now you control the speed with, you know, like the brakes and the gas and stuff like that. Okay, shifting. All right. And then the guys that design the track, you know, whether it's Daytona or uh, Nardo or any other track, most race tracks are very carefully engineered. You know, they have, and, and like Daytona also, 
And Nardo is banked as well. Daytona and Nardo are both banked. At least on the turns. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been up to Daytona to see a race. Raise your hands. Well, that's a good number of these. I'm going to have to try that one of these days. Uh, so, you know, that's your, that's your, uh, that's the scoop with centripetal acceleration. Okay. So just to, uh, to summarize, uh, because we have proportional triangles by insisting on uniform and circular motion, you have a velocity triangle that is proportional to position triangle. And Hey, you guys, that little squiggle mark between velocity triangle and the phrase position triangle. That means proportional to or similar to, all right? Because of that, we have this formula. Centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. And Sir Isaac Newton, F equals MA. Centripetal force is just M, whatever the mass of the car is, or the mass of the spacecraft, or whatever it happens to be that's moving on the circle. This is how many Newtons. So you can actually figure out the acceleration if you know how fast it's going and how big the circle is. You know, so if you have the speedometer rating and the radius of the circle or diameter, you got everything here you need for acceleration. To get the force, though, you need to know how many kilograms. That's a little tougher. King. You control the R by how you design the track. Okay. And, you know, if you're, or if, you, if you're just driving around, you know, if you're driving around in a parking lot, you control the R by how much steering wheel you turn left or right. Camille. It's the radius of the circle. R is the radius of the circle. All right, now we're going to apply this concept to the idea of centripetal force and acceleration. And we're going to apply it to gravity, uh, specifically Sir Isaac Newton. And he, he had this kind of an interesting idea that, that the moon on a circular orbit uh, has an acceleration caused by the same force that an apple falling out of an apple tree has. You know, so that famous, that famous myth, you know, the apple fell out of the apple tree and conked him on the head, and he thought up the idea of gravity. Well, this is kind of what he was thinking about. In other words, the apple, straight free fall, vertical free fall, gravity, acceleration, and velocity in the same direction, it's terrestrial. So make a note of this, apple, terrestrial, acceleration downward. Moon celestial object acceleration due to gravity is centripetal it's toward the center of the earth that's the same direction as the apple's acceleration but for the apple you just say you know it's not really centripetal because you know it's dropping straight down it's not all circular orbit but sir isaac newton said you know what i think these things are basically the same so he was able to get a decent measurement um, of the acceleration due to gravity, of course, not in meters, uh, but distances in feet, probably, and seconds. And then he could get a fairly decent estimate of the moon's acceleration, its centripetal acceleration, because they knew the distance to the, from the moon to the Earth in terms of Earth radii, and it's about 60 Earth radii. And... Um, the Earth's diameter was known. And then, of course, they knew how long it took to make one full circle around the Earth. You know, 27.3 days, something like that. So that's a certain number of seconds. So if you know the radius, you know, pi to 2 pi r for the distance, 27.3 days, convert that to seconds, and you could figure out how many meters per second. So you have v. And therefore, you have v squared in the numerator. You also have r, the radius uh, of their moon's orbit. So you can figure out its centripetal acceleration. Here's what he found. He found that the centripetal acceleration of the moon on its circular orbit was about 1 3600th of G. 
And he knew that the distance was about 1 60th from earth to the center, from the center of earth to the apple, to the surface of earth, is about 1 60th of the total distance to the moon. And so, sir, and so, hey, you guys, 60 to the second power, 3,600. So Sir Isaac Newton said, I do not think this is a coincidence. A coincidence. He said, I think this distance factor is part of the general law or universal law of gravitation. Let's talk about that. Here's what he decided. He said, I think the only two factors that matter are the mass of the two objects interacting gravitationally and then their distance apart. Now, those are the only two measurements you have to make. And if you can make those measurements, you can figure out the relative forces and stuff and figure out some accelerations. You can figure out where it's going to go, how soon it's going to get there, and you know what kind of rockets you need to get it there. Well, he didn't have rockets in his day, but I mean, that's what we do now, right? So his idea was the more mass you have, the more gravitational force, all right? So if it's a ratio, the mass measurements are going to be in the numerator. He said, all right, the distance is going to go in the denominator because if, if you have more distance, the force gets weaker. And he knew that because the moon was on such a weak acceleration. It was accelerating, but it wasn't very astounding. It's way less acceleration than an apple. But the apple is way closer. So here's what the law of universal gravitation due to Sir Isaac Newton is. And he said, I think this is it. He said, I have to put the mass in the numerator, and it's going to be the product. Because either object, the more mass of either object, means I have more newtons of force. And he said, the distance is going to go in the denominator. And because of the 3,660 squared coincidence, that's not a coincidence, he said it's going to be r squared in the dot, not r to the first, not r to the third, not r to the 3.12, not r to the negative 5.7, but exactly r to the second power in the denominator. And he said if you do that, that is the f that will explain the moon and the apple. Thereby making gravity universal. It's been very well verified, this force. And as I've mentioned before, all those uh, PhDs in hidden figures down at Houston working at those calculations, this is one of the, for this is one of the formulas they've got to put in there. You know, you know, a lot of distance polygons and all that stuff, and they've got to use this force too. Question. Oh, capital G. That's called Newton's constant or uh, gravitational constant. And it is a conversion factor because if you think about it, Camille, he, he's, he needs kilogram meters per second squared, a newton. But his measurements are kilograms squared in the numerator and meter squared in the denominator. That's not a, you know, kilogram squared per meter squared, that's not a newton. So he said, all right, to get a Newton out of that, I have to have a constant that cancels out the square, the meter squared in the denominator and makes it a meter in the numerator, cancels out one of the kilograms in the numerator, it makes it just kilograms instead of kilogram squared, and it introduces second squared into the denominator. And that's what capital G does. Now, an example of a conversion factor like that is if you remember from like sixth grade, seventh grade uh, science class, you know, uh, converting between Celsius and Fahrenheit, and it's like a pain in the, you know, a you know, bunch of formulas. But one of the numbers in both formulas is five ninths. 
You know, to go from uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius, you know, you, you add and subtract 32s, and, and you multiply by 5 ninths or 9 fifths if you're going the other way. You remember that? That's a conversion factor. And that's between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Okay? Now, this is a conversion factor between meter squared or between kilogram squared per meter squared and newtons, kilogram meter per second squared. It is a number, and it has a value, and you can look it up in the book, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, and then a bunch of units. And Yeah, I know it, because I, I use it a lot. And it turns out that it's not just a conversion factor, though. In Einstein's theory of relativity, capital G is the factor that actually controls the size and intensity and strength of black holes the things from which there's no escape if you get close enough. And black holes, of course, are something I've done a lot of study on. Now, I'm, this is our universe, law of universal gravitation. Let's work out an example that puts together universal gravitation, gm1, m2 over r squared, and v squared over mv squared over r. Okay? So let's talk about a satellite orbiting the Earth. Okay, so the masses are going to be capital M, Nicole, for the mass of the Earth, and small m, subscript F, S, for the mass of the satellite. All right? Now, you know, NASA has to work with this all the time. They have to set the distance, you know, how high is the orbit above the surface of the Earth, you know, or how far from the center of the Earth, technically. And then they have to have the right rockets, you know, you have to... You know, if you're going to send something to the moon, you've got to have a big, big, big rocket. But if you're just going to send it up, you know, a few, a, a few hundred kilometers, you don't need quite as much of a rocket. So all that stuff they care about. Now, the orbit that we're going to use to work out this joining, the synthesis of universal gravitation and centripetal, centripetal force is a circular orbit. Okay, a uniform circular orbit. And so we're going to use centripetal force and universal gravitation. Here they are. All right. On the left, gravitation. And on the right, centripetal force. Now, centripetal force, that's your MA. Okay. And then the, the source of the force that gives you the MA that's G, M1, M2. Actually, it's G, capital M, M subscript S, divided by the square of the distance from the center of the Earth to the orbit, you know, whatever the spacecraft is. All right? Now, um, if you look at this carefully, the mass of the satellite appears in both sides. And for that reason, guess what? It's out of here. So get, go ahead and crush them. All right, they're out of here. All right, here's the leftovers. Okay, G times capital M over R squared. And that's equal to V squared over R. Now, my wonderful students, G M over R squared um, is, that's actually the value of G. 9.8 meters per second. If R is the radius of the surface of the Earth, okay, that's the value of G. So this big fancy looking quotient here on the left, that's just nine, it just works out to 9.8 meters per second squared if you're at the surface of the Earth. Now, if you're out in space by a couple hundred miles, you know, 2,000 miles, wherever you happen to be, then no, it's going to be a little bit weaker out there. But, you know, you can calculate it there too. All right, so now it's a little bit simplified. But you know what, Carolyn Cook, we could do a little bit more simplification here because I got R's on both sides. So let's get this R out of the right side. Let's park it on top of the left and cancel. And there's GM over R equals V squared. Now think about that. If you know what the R is that you want, you can figure out the V squared that you want and design your rockets accordingly. If you know the speed you want, 
you can figure out, okay, how high do I have to park my orbit? How big is R? So if you figure out V or R, if you require V, you can figure out R. If you require R, you can figure out the required V. All right, now, um, here's an example. If you know the radius for the orbit that you want, you can figure out the required V and design your rockets appropriately. Case in point, a spy satellite. You want it to be low enough. You want the radius of the orbit to be low enough to the Earth so that you can keep an eyeball on the Russians. All right? <laughs> Boris Putin. All those jokers over there. All right, so, so, so you, all right. I require uh, an elevation of 129 miles, and then my cameras will focus on Boris Putin's nose. And then you design your rocks appropriately, get the right V and everything. Other way, let's say you need an orbit that has a certain speed. And then you can figure out the required radius of the orbit. You know how high? So in other words, if you have to have a satellite that orbits Earth once per day, yeah, you could do it. You just got to get it to the right altitude. And we have those. Those satellites are called geosynchronous satellites. They orbit the Earth. The Earth spins on its own once per day, once every 24 hours. And at the same time, the thing's orbiting. So it seems to be up there, you know, one location in the sky. It's in motion, but it doesn't to us because we're in motion too. So we're exactly synchronized with it. And that's the communica communication satellites that we rely on. So if you have Dish Network or DirecTV or something like that, and all the big TV stations, you see them with, you know, ground stations sending and receiving from space. Yeah, that's what they got. So... This law, GM1, M2 over R squared, it's known as an R squared, inverse R squared force. And mathematically, through some bodacious calculus, which we won't go into here, but which I have drugged myself through, you can prove that it's an infinite range force. In other words, if it was inverse R to the third power, or inverse R to the 1.26 power, or anything other than inverse R squared, it would not be infinite range. But if it's exactly 1 over R squared, yup, you have a force that rules the universe. GM1, M2 over R squared. Now, we're going to find out that the electromagnetic interaction also is inverse R squared, but it has a significant difference. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. All right. Last set of notes for today. We're not done. Sir Edmund Halley, friend of Sir Isaac Newton, contemporary. They were friends. He said, look, okay, Sir Isaac, if this is really true, your theory of universal gravitation, let's see if it applies to comets. Because we know that these things, they or that we know that the celestial objects that we see the planets, they orbit on elliptical paths. They're very close to circles, but they're actually elliptical. And one of the guys um, before Sir Isaac Newton, maybe in the 50, 100 years before Sir Isaac, figured out, his name was Johannes Kepler, he figured out this third law here. The average orbital distance to the third power is proportional to the square of the orbital period. That's this formula down here. Here's the square of the orbital period, P. Well, there's a bunch of constants here. And Camille, these are conversion constants. Okay, It's a mathematical statement. So Galileo lo would have loved this. I mean, he, was, you know, he wasn't around. But. And then here's A, the average distance of the orbit, average size of the orbit, to the third power. Now, it's weird. Third power and second power, and they're proportional. But if you work out the calculus, as Sir Edmund Halley did, he said, yeah. And he said, therefore, I think comets obey this. And, and therefore, comets, they don't just come and disappear forever. They repeat. He said, 
They're going to return periodically. And he had studied a lot of comets. Matter of fact, he predicted that the well-observed comets of 1531, which was before his day, 1607, which was before his day, 1682, which was in his day, were all the same comet. They weren't three different comets. And he said, I predict that this comet is going to come back in 1758, toward the end of the year, based on Sir Isaac Newton's universal law of gravitation. And by God, it did return, right on time, 1758. Both of these guys were, were passed away by that time. But you know what? They were right on the money. Edmund Halley and Sir Isaac Newton, you're going to have some reading about them on Homework 7. It will activate probably tomorrow. Uh, you're dismissed. I'll see you next week. Homework 7, due on Tuesday. And we're on time. We're not over. Oh, I thought you were going to give me five. No. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wasn't able to take the test because I was having complications with procedure. It's irrelevant, but will I be able to come here? Uh, will you be here tomorrow? I know you said that you're here. Maybe.